Today on Visual Economic, we're going to talk about what is almost a worldwide conspiracy that many people have heard about, but hardly anyone understands exactly what it is. Specifically, we're going to talk about banks, how they work on the inside, and whether, as many claim, they steal our money on a large scale without us realizing it. But first, let's take it one step at a time. The first thing we have to do is explain exactly what this conspiracy consists of. Check this out. What you are seeing right now on the screen is nothing less than the total volume of dollars that are circulating in the global economy. That is all the money that has been created by the Federal Reserve and that we could have in our pockets. So far, so good. Five trillion dollars that have been created over the last few years. However, now I want you to notice the blue line that has just appeared. If we said that the red line was the total number of dollars created, the blue line is the sum of all the bank deposits in dollars that exist on the planet. And here comes the interesting part. How is it possible that if only five trillion dollars have been created worldwide, then the sum of bank deposits is more than 20 trillion dollars. <laughs> It is as if the banks had 15 trillion more in their current accounts than actually exist. It's as if the bank has money, fake money, money that they've created out of thin air. Which, come to think of it, means that much of the money we all have saved simply no longer exists. The bank is lying to us in its accounts. But wait a minute, there must be a mistake or something. It must be a statistical misinterpretation or something like that, right? How can it be possible that the bank doesn't have my money and is cheating me with artificial money? I'm sorry, no, this isn't an error, a statistical anomaly, or anything like that. In fact, if we study the accounts of any bank we can think of, for example, Deutsche Bank, we will see that the money they actually have in their hands is much, much less than the deposit of their clients. So given this, I think the questions are clear. Why on earth are banks allowed to take money out of thin air? Are they cheating us all and taking advantage of the fact that most people don't know how the banking system works? Should we march en masse to take our money out of the banks? Well, today on Visual Economic, we will answer all of these questions. So don't rush to the bank just yet and stay tuned. To begin to understand the whole phenomenon of fictitious money, we must first start with the basics. We must first understand how the banking business works, and more specifically, the lending business. So to do that, we're going to illustrate the process with a story. So here is David. David is a person who has been in the construction business for several years, and after putting up with a multitude of grumpy bosses, has finally been encouraged to start his own company. Good for David. His company is going to be called, imaginatively, David's Construction. It is going to be dedicated to renovating houses and building new ones, and as you can imagine, David will have have to hire some workers, he will have to buy machinery, and of course he'll need materials to work with. However, all of that is not free. David doesn't have enough money to pay for everything he needs, so his only option is to go to his local bank and ask them for a loan. Upon arriving at the bank, David explains his plans to the banker and demonstrates that he has a good business project and that if he gets the loan, he'll be able to pay it back without any problems. The banker observes that David's plan will indeed be profitable and grants him the loan, a loan amounting to $100,000. And keep watching, because here comes the interest interesting part. When the bank grants David the loan, instead of giving him the $100,000 in a briefcase, it opens a bank account in which it notes that David has $100,000. After that, David plays his suppliers, who also have an account in the same bank, and those $100,000 are deleted from David's account and added to the supplier's account. The thing is, have you noticed that this money has come out of nowhere? That is, before David took out the loan, the bank had reserves of, say, $1 million corresponding to the savings of all of its customers, right? In a normal loan, the the bank would have to take the money out of the safe and be left with only $900,000 in reserves. However, the reserves are still $1 million. And not only that, but David's suppliers now have $100,000 more written down in their accounts. In other words, the bank is telling its customers that they have more money than they actually have in reserve. You realize that what the bank has done is simply to write in a computer that David has $100,000 that in reality came out of nowhere, and that these $100,000 that have come out of nowhere have been moved from David's account to the supplier's account. The new money does not exist. The new money is just a little number on a computer screen. Although, if you think that's bad, hold on to your horses, because it doesn't stop there. What's worse is even though the money from David's loan is completely made up, David will have to pay interest on this money that doesn't exist from the very beginning. In essence, we pay interest to the bank for money that did not exist, does not exist, and will not exist. Hence, we see in the graphs that only a proportion of all deposits exist in real money. That proportion is what is called the fractional reserve. <laughs> 
As you may already be thinking, this method of banks creating fake money, charging interest on money that doesn't exist, and seemingly cheating us is something that has led to conspiracies and protests of all kinds. Without digging too deep, in the making of this video, we have come to see how the Illuminati were accused of being behind all of this, and how governments were controlled by elites who allowed fractional reserve system to steal our money without us realizing it. But wait, many of these conspiracies encourage us to take our money out of the bank and collapse the system. Somehow, they believe that since there is so much counterfeit money backed by nothing, if we all withdraw our money, then the system would collapse. But is this really true? Is the explanation we have given of counterfeit money really a thing that happens in reality? Or perhaps is the banking industry much more complex than the story that we've just told you? Well, I'm afraid that that is the case. And I'm afraid that conspiracies remain mere conspiracies far removed from reality. Now then, how on earth do you explain the existence of so much fake money? Are the deposits in the bank simply notes in a computer without any value? Are they really stealing something from us by charging interest? Let's take a look. Down to Earth. Let's go back to David's story. But in this case, let's imagine that in David's world, banks don't exist. In the same way as before, David wants to set up his company and needs a loan to do so. However, this time, instead of asking the bank for the loan, he asks a friend who has a computer company that is doing well and has a little bit of money to spare. So this friend lends $100,000 to David and in turn, David gives his friend a piece of paper, a title that certifies that there is a debt of $100,000. When the time comes for the debt to be repaid, David will deliver the $100,000 plus interest to the person who returns the bond. So far, so good. I wish I had friends like that. The next day, David goes to the construction supplier and buys the machinery and tools he needs with that $100,000 his friend gave him. After the purchase, David is left without money. Now the $100,000 are in the hands of the suppliers. And pay attention, because here comes the interesting part. With that $100,000, the machine supplier decides to buy some new software. And guess where he buys it from? Exactly, David's friend who has a computer company. Now, David's friend not only has the original original $100,000 back, but also has a title acknowledging David's debt of $100,000 plus interest. And as it seems to him that he has a lot of money, he decides to buy a luxury car. And at the dealership, instead of paying in cash, he asks the seller if he's willing to accept the title of the debt as payment. With it, the dealer would not only get the $100,000 for the car, but also the interest. And here, the car dealer has two options. The first is that he does not trust David and does not accept the paper title. And the second, the most interesting, is the option that he trusts that David will pay the debt without problem. He will then accept the agreement and sell the car in exchange for the paper that in the future, he will be able to exchange for $100,000 plus interest. If this happens, understand that exactly the same thing will have happened as happened with the banks in the first example. The money will have multiplied out of thin air. By the time the seller of the car has accepted David's title as payment, it has become money. That is, not only does the original $100,000 still exist, but there is now a new title circulating in the economy that has exchanged for an additional $100,000. In other words, through debt, money has doubled. And notice that it is not just a piece of paper that comes out of thin air. In the future, David will earn new money with his company and will get enough money to pay the debt. If everybody trusts David, everybody will accept the title that recognizes this debt. And in practice, it'll be the same as actual money. Money. When banks lend money to someone, they are not taking it out of thin air. What they are doing is creating a David-like security, a commitment to pay in the future that is perfectly marketable and perfectly substitutable for physical money. Everybody trusts the title of the bank because everybody believes that the bank gives secure loans, which in principle is what happens as long as banks are not bailed out when they do badly and fail, because then they lose the incentive to take an extreme precaution, which you might remember happened pretty recently in 2008. In short, when the bank creates money, it's not actually actually creating it out of nothing. What it is doing is anticipating money from the future. And that is something that would happen in economies without banks, as well as in economies with banks. What new money creates is money from the future brought to the present, or in other words, credit. And since credit can have long terms, but physical money never stops circulating, in the end, there is more physical money than debt certificates. But that is because even though there's not much physical money, it never stays still. 
In the same sense, what the bank does is to act as a financial intermediary. In other words, the bank uses the money of savers and lends it to people who need money in exchange for their virtual papers. These papers can be mortgages, consumer loans, or even government bonds. In fact, if you look at Deutsche Bank's annual accounts again, you will see that the customer deposits are not backed by 100% cash, but they are backed by debts of people who have borrowed money from the bank. In short, we could say that even if the bank does not constantly have the money from its deposits in cash, it has plenty of money in investments backing the deposits. And think about it. At the end of the day, it's not necessary to have all the money you owe in cash. Bank customers do not usually withdraw it all from one day to the next. In any case, I know what many of you are thinking. The bank lends my money without my consent. I haven't given my permission to lend anything. The bank has my money to keep. That's what a deposit means. Well, here we could get into a lot of debate about what is or is not a deposit, but without going any further at Visual Economic, we have consulted real current account contracts and what they say is the following. In the account, the bank will record the amounts that the holder or third parties deliver for payment and will debit the withdrawals of funds and other payment orders. BBVA, current account agreement. In other words, what the bank commits to when we bring our money is to return it to us when we ask for it, not to keep the money in a safe. On the other hand, don't think that banks can lend as much as they want and have very little cash in reserves. In general, each country has its own regulations that require a percentage of cash to back up deposits. To give you an idea, in the Eurozone, for every 100 euros in deposits, at least one euro must be kept in cash. In other words, Europe has a legal fractional reserve of 1%. That reserve is a minimum. Banks may decide for security reasons to raise it to a higher percentage. At this point, it is now your turn. Did you know that banks operated by means of payment and collection commitments in the future? You can leave us your answer in the comments below. If you like this video, like it so we know and activate the little bell button down there so you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. All the best and I'll see you next time.